what up IB in the building and we back for another video and I'm back with another team breakdown video last team breakdown I did was of the Philadelphia 76ers for this one we're staying in the Eastern Conference but we're just going down a tier in terms of talent in the Eastern Conference today we're breaking down the Orlando Magic now I probably alluded to this in my realistic rebuild of the Orlando Magic but the Magic are a team that just like to hover around the eighth seed they haven't done much to really add high-end talent to their team in terms of uh, a blockbuster trade or bottom bottoming out for a high draft pick and those are two things that are in the formula of being around 500 being around the eighth seed or at the tail end of the lottery year in and year out Regardless, they are a very interesting team to break down once you look at every core piece of the entire team. And without further ado, let's break down the Orlando Magic. So the team state of the Orlando Magic, they were 30 and 35 at the time of suspension, which put them at 8th in the Eastern Conference. This was a record that wouldn't even get you tied for 9th in the Western Conference. You can have a losing record in the East and still make the playoffs, so it just speaks to the talent level. Let's take a look at core players for the Orlando Magic team. Let's start off with their former All-Star center, Nikola Vucevic. This year he's averaging 19.5 points per game, 11 rebounds, 3.7 assists on 47% from the field and 32.9% from three-point land on 4.6 three-point attempts per game. The strengths for Nikola Vucevic, he is a very solid low post scorer. He's skilled and crafty and he needs those skills and, and that craftiness because he's not overly explosive and he shows that in the low post with a bevy of moves. He is a good three-point shooting big even though his percentage is down this year from a, what it was last year. Vucevic is still a threat from three similar to how this year Brooke Lopez's three-point shot is kind of struggling but still you don't want to leave Brooke Lopez open because he made a name for himself last year that he is a lethal threat from downtown. Same goes for Vucevic. Vucevic is also a great passing big man. 3.7 assists per game is really good. It's great for a center and he doesn't turn the ball over much. I believe he has a assist to turnover ratio that is higher than 2.5. He's a great free throw shooter for a big man. He's a great rebounder. All in all, he's a really great offensive center and that bodes well for him, especially for this new NBA in terms of teams going to the philosophy of five out, having everybody on the floor being a threat from three point land, including the center. Nikola Vucevic fits right in with that philosophy. And the Magic's offense was much better with him on the court. They had a 5.8 point higher offensive rating with him on the court than with him off the court. Moving into weaknesses, um, I just want to point out that his field goal percentage and three point percentage, they're both down this year from last year. Last year he was shooting 51.8% from the field. This year, like I said, 47%. Last year he was shooting 36.4% from three. This year, 32.9 though this year he is taking more attempts per game and the I don't know if this is a myth that I'm gonna have to prove sometime in the future but last year was his contract year and you know how NBA players play when this their contract year they ball out and try to get the bag and Vucevic was successful because he did get that bag his numbers have fallen off since that contract year percentage wise and points per game wise as well all of the strengths I mentioned about Vucevic came on the offensive side of the ball because on defense he's really lackluster. He kind of gets picked on on the defensive side of the ball because he's not very quick. He kind of lumbers on that side. He's slow to rotations and it's kind of hard for him to defend the pick and roll because of his lack of quickness in terms of deciding whether to tag the roll man, hedge on the ball handler. Even if he does make the decisions quickly, his athleticism doesn't allow him to uh, execute those decisions quick enough. He's not much of a rim protector, he only averages 0.9 blocks per game. And the Magic were a much better defense with him off the floor. They had a 4.3 point 
better defensive rating with him off the court. And that's going to translate or that's going to segue into who the Magic have at center when Vucevic is off the court, uh, Mo Bamba, who's kind of the antithesis of what Vucevic is right now. In terms of production, um, Vucevic is producing on the offensive side of the ball, makes his impact known there, while Bamba makes his bread, makes his presence known and felt on the defensive side of the ball, but we'll get to that later. Next player I want to break down is Evan Fournier. This year is kind of like a career year for him. He's averaging 18.8 points per game, 3.2 assists per game, on 47% from the field and 40.6% from three. So the strengths are obvious. He is a great three-point shooter. A great three-point percentage, 40.6 on a lot of attempts. He's shooting that percentage on 6.7 three-point attempts per game. He's also a good shot creator, a improved shot creator over the past three years. Two seasons ago, 57.3% of his field goals were assisted on. Last season, 50.8% of his field goals were assisted on. This year, that stat is down to 44% of his field goals being assisted on. So he's creating for himself a lot more this season in particular. Evan Fournier's scoring prowess is known at almost every spot in the court uh, distance-wise. He's a great finisher at the rim at 67.3%. From 3 to 10 feet, which is your floater range he's shooting 47.7 percent from 16 to three point land which is your long two range he's shooting 47.8 percent and from three he's shooting 40.6 percent the only percentage for him that's lagging behind is his 10 to 16 foot jump shot it's only at 39.8 percent which isn't a horrible percent percentage for weaknesses the number one weaknesses for evan fournier starts with his name do not google fournier by itself don't do it I was told not to do it. I did it anyway because I was curious. I regretted it. Do not Google his name. Okay, now that that's out of the way. Um, <laughs> um, the real weakness for Evan Fournier is defense. He's never really been known as a defender, a plus defender. There's only been two seasons in his eight year career where Orlando has had a better defensive rating with him on the floor than with him off. And those seasons came when he was receiving limited minutes earlier, earlier on in his career. And that trend has continued of the, uh, the Orlando Magic being a better defense with him off the floor. They host a 6.6 .6 better defensive rating with him off the floor than with him on. Um, so like Vucevic, Fournier is a great player to have on offense, but on defense, he kind of holds down the team. Next player to break down is Aaron Gordon. This year he's averaging 14.4 points a game, 7.6 rebounds per game, 3.7 assists per game, on 43% from the field and 30.1% from three-point land. Um, the strengths for Aaron Gordon, he is a freak athlete. We've seen him in the slam dunk contest year in and year out. Though he hasn't won it, he probably deserved to win a couple of them. He is a freak athlete and he uses that athleticism to his advantage to help him finish at the rim. He is a great finisher, shooting 70% at the rim, zero to three feet. He's really turned himself into a plus defender over the past couple years and turned himself into a valuable asset on the defensive side of the ball. He's a big body at 6'8", around 230, if I had to guess. He kind of has that like Blake Griffin type of size. Aaron Gordon has proven that he can guard small forwards and power forwards in the past couple of years and maybe even guarding some small ball fives in today's NBA. I think he'll get more opportunity to do so with the direction that the NBA is going towards. He's a really good playmaker for the power forward position, like I said, getting 3.7 assists per game and he's doing it on a solid assist to turnover ratio of 2.31. And he also still has youth on his side. He's been in the league for a minute, but he's still only 24 years old only about to enter his prime. The weaknesses for Aaron Gordon, this is a weakness that's kind of plagued him for his entire career. He's always struggled with three ball. Uh, he appeared to make great strides with that three point shot last year. He shot 35% on 4.4 attempts last year, but this year he's regressed back down to 30.1% on slightly fewer attempts. In my opinion, the three ball could really unlock him as an incredibly valuable 3 and D player 
in today's league. And not just the three-point shot, he struggled with his jump shot in general. He is shooting an atrocious 16.1% from 16 feet to the three-point line. Now, only 9% of his shots come from there, but damn, 16.1% from that range is, is putrid. And his struggles also follow him at the free throw line. He's only shooting 67.5% from the stripe. Now that I've mentioned some of the veterans or the three core veterans of this Orlando Magic team, I want to move to the young core of this team, the building blocks of this Orlando Magic team moving forward. Let's start off with the 2018 draftee center Mo Bamba. This season, he's averaging about 5.5 points per game, 5 rebounds, 1.4 blocks per game on 46.8% from the field, 35.6% from three, and 67.4% from the charity stripe. Now his strengths, unlike Fournier, Mo Bamba has a strength in his name. Mo Bamba is a dope ass name. Like Mo Bamba, imagine growing up with that fool. And you know, the song, fire song, for a minute got played out after a while um <laughs> but let's actually get to his strengths uh defense this is where mo bamba makes his presence known defense rim protection like i said he's averaging 1.4 blocks per game but per 36 mo bamba is averaging 3.5 blocks per 36 which is absurd so mo bamba's not getting that many minutes this year but when he does come in the game, he immediately alters shots uh, whenever they come at the rim. His defensive IQ has improved this year. Last year in his rookie year, he seemed really unsure of how to guard NBA defenses in terms of switching, rotations, uh, pick and rolls. But now this year, I've seen that a lot of his blocks are coming off of rotations um, and help, weak side help um, blocks. And he's also got some blocks in which he has been the lone defender in the pick and roll. The on-ball defender gets screened. The ball handler gets by the on-ball defender. And it puts Mo Bamba in a, that typical center situation where the center has to guard the ball handler and the roll man and try to gauge whether the roll man is going to receive the pass or the ball handler is going to go up with a shot. Maybe a floater, maybe a pull-up jump shot. Mo Bamba has done a great job in reading the pick and roll defense, and I've seen him get a lot of blocks in those type of situations. More of Mo Bamba's strengths come in the things that you cannot teach, length and athleticism. Mo Bamba is seven foot and he has a ridiculous wingspan, and I mean ridiculous. The man looks clunky as hell whenever I use him in 2K because of his wingspan. And he's able to move really well as a seven footer. He's really quick on his feet. Um, those are two things that are really or already do two things that already do help him immensely on the defensive side of the ball Another strength is his shooting this year. He's taking three three-point attempts per game and he's shooting an efficient 35.6% Which is really great for a center that is a great three-point percentage for a center and that will allow him to be a valuable uh, center in today's league like I said with centers um being more and more expected to have a three-point shot in their arsenal, Mo Bamba should fit right in to today's game. Especially with him having or providing a plus on the defensive side of the ball, I think in the future he will be a hot commodity if he ever hits the free agency or trade market. He's also improved his free throw shooting by 8.7%. He still has a ways to go as he's shooting below 70%, but it is a good sign that he has improved his free throw shooting significantly. I also want to get into some things that I've seen just using the eye test. Um, Mo Bamba has shown signs that he is willing to do more than just catch and shoot. I've seen a couple instances where he has run the pick and pop and he's been open, he's caught the ball, and he does a head fake while the defender closes out on him, and he does a little side dribble pull up at the elbow in the mid-range area knocks it down and it looked natural and that just showcases a sign that he is confident in his ability to do more than just catch and shoot the ball or catch and pass it if he's not open 
He's also a good rebounder. Um, given his length, he's bound to be a good rebounder, averaging 12.4 rebounds per 36. And he is young. He's only 22 years old. This is only his second year in the league. He has a lot of room to grow. So let's get into those areas of Mobamba's game that he has to grow in, his weaknesses. He has a very limited offensive game. He has a low field goal percentage for his center. Being that lengthy and athletic, kind of surprising for him to have a field goal percentage below 50%. He doesn't really provide much shot creation, just catching the ball and doing something with it. He doesn't really have a low post game kind of at all. Um, and that's not a horrible thing because the game is, the NBA game is kind of gravitating away from the post. One thing that holds down his field goal percentage is mid-range shooting from 3 to 10 feet. His numbers are atrocious. From 3 to 10 feet, Mo Bamba is shooting 19.4% from the field. And 13% of his shot attempts come from there. So that's one thing that's really holding down that percentage. He is a good shooter from 10 to 16 feet at 44.4%, but from 16 to three point land, he's shooting 29.4% from three. Um, he's kind of have to lim he has to limit those long twos and just uh, commit himself to just taking three balls. I don't know why his percentage from three to 10 feet is so low. I have to do some more research into that, but that's kind of unacceptable for a seven foot athletic specimen like Mo Bamba. Another weakness is his weight. Uh, he came into the league as kind of a slender man. It was evident in his physique and his long slender arms. He's about listed at about 7 feet, 220 pounds. Um, so when he goes up against physically imposing, bruising centers, maybe like your DeMarcus Cousins or your Steven Adams or Joel Embiid, they will bully him inside and they will punish him on the glass, offensive and defensive glass. He's going to have to put on some weights in order to stand a chance against those guys night in and night out. I did hear that he put on some weight over quarantine. Uh, I haven't seen any images of him regarding his weight gain, but hopefully it's true. Hopefully he put on some weight and some muscle. Another weakness is that he's a bit foul prone. Um, that's obviously going to happen for being a young center. And not only a young center, but a young center who's antsy to get blocked shots. He's going to foul a bit. He's going to bite on head fakes and whatnot. He averages 4.8 fouls per game per 36. But I think that number will drop uh, with more experience and more years in the NBA. Next member of the Orlando Magic's promising young core is the 2017 former number one pick overall, Markel Fultz. This year he's averaging 12 points per game, 5.2 assists per game, 1.3 steals per game on 47.3% from the field, 72.3% from the free throw line, and 25.4% from three point land. The strengths for Markel Fultz, he's a really good slasher. He's really good at attacking the rim. For a guard that's always going to be given a cushion and dare to shoot, 47% from the field is pretty good especially on a team devoid of much established talent and playmaking outside of Marco Fultz. He shoots 65.1% at the rim and 42.6% in floater range, which is pretty solid. Marco Fultz is tremendously athletic. He's collected quite a few posters in his short career. He's got, he's got good strength for a point guard. If you just look at him, he seems really burly and bulky, not bulky, bulky uh, paints him as he's overweight. He's not bulky. He's really strong, well put together. He's about 6'3", 200 pounds. And for that weight and size, he's really quick and explosive. He moves well for his weight. That combination of strength and speed is lethal and will help him in the future and in the present. Fultz is a capable mid-range shooter. 27.7% of his shot attempts come from 10 feet out to the three-point line. And that's obviously going to be a go-to shot for him without a consistent three ball at the moment. Using one dribble pull-ups at the elbow or in pick and roll situations when the defender goes under the screen. Or I've seen him use that mid-range shot in ISO situations when uh, the defender is giving him a ridiculous amount of space. He'll take one or two dribbles, hard dribbles in like he's going to drive and then he'll pull up on a dime and knock the J down. 
From 10 to 16 feet, he's shooting 40.8% from the field, and from 16 to the three-point line, he's shooting 44.8% from the field, which is really, really good. He's an improved free throw shooter. Um, he's improved his f free throw percentage from 57 to 72% this year, which is just a pleasant sight for everybody who has to watch Mark Hill shoot free throws. It's good to see him knock him down at a respectable clip. And Marco Fultz's presence on the basketball court for the Magic on offense has been uh, pleasant. He's helped their offense. The Magic have a 4.6 higher offensive rating with him on the court. Marco Fultz has shown good court vision. He's leading his team in assists at 5.2 assists per game. And the Magic are a team that needs as much playmaking as they can get. And Marco Fultz has tried to build that void to the best of his ability. And he's a good floor general because he doesn't turn the ball over too much. He has a 2.6 assist to turnover ratio. I've seen him make good reads in the pick and roll and off of his dribble penetration. Marco Fultz is a really shifty ball handler. Um, he's crafty. He can bust out a couple crossovers between legs. And he's really good at changing speeds and stopping on a dime to throw the defender off. Markel Fultz is also a really good rebounding guard. He's racked up a couple of triple doubles in his career. And another strength of Markel Fultz, this is kind of a recurring theme, but Markel Fultz is young and that is a strength because Markel Fultz has technically been in the league for three years, but his first two years he barely played. His first year he didn't play at all, he played less than 10 games. And I think in his second year, he played less than 20 games. So this is basically his first full NBA season. And that can bode well for him because because right now, Marco Fultz is playing really well for it being his first year. He still has a lot of experience to garner in terms of reading defenses and um, reading NBA offenses. He can get his form back, his shooting form back. It, it doesn't look as horrible as it once did, but it still kind of looks um, a little clunky, a little unnatural. Hopefully he can get his stride back. And I think given time of him identifying and getting used to NBA offenses, I think he'll realize his defensive potential because in my opinion, he has a high defensive potential with him being an athletic point guard, um, good size for a point guard, and really strong for a point guard i think he'll really um have high defensive potential and i think he'll eventually live up to it especially with him being on a team with a defensive head coach in steve clifford so weaknesses for markel fultz they're obvious um it's a shooting it's obviously going to draw back to that injury that he sustained in his rookie year that effed up his shot form for the past three years and he's still getting over it but it is still a weakness in his game he's not shooting it uh confidently he's not confident in that shot he's only taking about 1.8 attempts per game and he shoots it inefficiently his three-point percentage is low even though he's not even taking that many of them and another weakness is his lack of experience um he's still learning the nuances of the nba learning nba defenses reading nba offense offenses he's still learning that so um the lack of experience and youth they're the two same things but they can be a strength and a weakness in different ways that you look at it the final member of the orlando magic's young promising core is jonathan isaac now i think he is the most interesting out of the three in my opinion but let's get into his stats this year is he averaged 12 points per game 6.9 rebounds per game 46.3% from the field, 33% from three-point land, 2.4 blocks per game, and 1.6 steals per game. Now, Jonathan Isaac, the strength is obvious for him, defense. In my opinion, he has the potential to be a perennial first-team all-defense member. He is a lockdown defender on the ball, and he's capable of defending multiple positions on the court. And in my opinion, he might end up one day being able to defend all five position at any given time he's really just he's extremely disruptive 2.4 blocks per game and 1.6 steals per game is almost unheard of and what sets him apart from most of your disruptive defenders jonathan isaac does it without fouling he was able to average 2.4 blocks per game 1.6 steals per game 
he was able to do all that disruption while only getting called for 2.5 fouls per game. Jonathan Isaac is another player that has a strength in something that you can't teach, his length. He is another player on this Magic team that is ridiculously tall at 6'11 with a ridiculously long wingspan and that can only help his defensive prowess. Isaac has an improving offensive game, his field goal percentage and points per game average has improved every season of his career. He went from in his rookie year averaging 5.4 points a game to a sophomore year averaging 9.6 points per game to this year where he averaged 12 points per game. In his rookie year he shot an inefficient 37.9% from the field and the sophomore year he improved to 43% from the field and this year he shot 46.3% from the field. Another aspect of his improving offensive game was his ability to generate his own shot. His unassisted field goal percentage decreased every season of his career thus far. In his rookie year, 66.7% of his two-point attempts were assisted. This year, 58.8% of his field goal attempts were assisted, showing that he has improved his ability to create for himself without the help of a point guard or just a player on his team. Another aspect of his offensive game that has improved is his corner three ball percentage. In his rookie year, he shot 26.3% from corner threes. Sophomore year, he shot 33% from three, from the corner three ball. And this year, he shot a whopping 39.1% from the corner three. Is he on pace to become a souped up PJ Tucker? Y'all know PJ Tucker is a player, a 3 and D player who thrives on the corner three. He exclusively shoots corner threes. And PJ Tucker is a player known for his ability to play multiple positions. I mean, he's playing center on the Houston Rockets and he came in the league as a small forward. That just shows his multi-positional defensive prowess. Jonathan Isaac, is four inches taller than PJ Tucker. Wait, no, PJ Tucker is 6'5. Jonathan Isaac is 6'11. Jonathan Isaac is six inches taller than PJ Tucker, already showing a higher defensive ceiling than PJ Tucker ever had. And he showed that he can shoot the three ball, the corner three ball, efficiently. He's on pace to becoming a souped up, more athletic, more dynamic, longer, taller PJ Tucker. And that is scary because he still has a lot of room to grow. All right, weaknesses of Jonathan Isaac. Here's where it gets interesting. His durability is really in question. He sustained season ending injuries in his rookie year and this year. This year was cut short due to injury. He only played around 32 games this year. His rookie year, he was only able to play 27 games this year. Um, durability is gonna be a major question for him going forward. Another weakness for Isaac is his weight. Jonathan Isaac is another player on this Magic team that is going to have to add some weight or strength in order to increase his ability to defend low post centers and low post power forwards and to rebound with those big body bigs. And although his offensive game has improved every year of his career, it's still limited. Um, he doesn't really have that consistent shot creation in his game but I would not count it out because he's shown improvement every year of his career. And also I spoke on Jonathan Isaac's corner three ball um, mastery. The three point shot in general for him needs or has some room for improvement because his three point percentage away from the corner is not great. Hopefully he can eventually get to shooting above league average from the three ball because if he does, he's basically going to be the definition of 3 and D. Now we get to direction of this Orlando Magic team. Like I said, Orlando is a team that loves hanging around that 8 seed and this year is no different. So in their eyes, they're competing. <laughs> they're competing for a championship in their eyes. This is probably how they view it. They were able to compete for an 8 seed despite the injury of Jonathan Isaac and he's improving every year so he's going to come back next year better than ever. Mo Bamba is going to continue to improve. Fultz, this was his first full NBA season and it was promising. Vucevic is signed to a long-term deal. I think he has three more years after this year. Aaron Gordon is entering his prime. They can re-sign Fournier if he doesn't pick up his player option and they'll have another pick just outside the lottery that can help this team win now. 
that's probably how they look at it. Well, from my perspective and my opinion, if this team were serious about eventually contending in the playoffs, this is the plan of action that I would employ. They need to get assets for Nikola Vucevic in a trade. Maybe a contender would want a floor spacing center. Uh, for example, maybe the Lakers. I'm not saying I would do this. Um, Laker fan Ryan here. I'm not saying I would do this, but I could see the Lakers maybe getting desperate if they don't win a championship this year. LeBron is only getting older. They're not going to have max, max, maximum money in free agency to add the top tier guy, but they will have around 25 million in cap space and they can move a contract to add a third quote unquote star. And that could be what Vucevic is a quote unquote star, especially his ability to space the floor and play center since AD does not like playing center and the Lakers don't want him to play center. That could be some, that's just an example of a type of trade that could arise moving forward. A contender might get desperate to add a third quote unquote star. Vucevic could fill that role. And in return, the Orlando Magic could get some young assets or maybe some future protected picks from uh, that contending team. The next thing to test would be to see if Aaron Gordon and Jonathan Isaac could work as a forward tandem together. What I mean in working together, I mean mainly can Aaron Gordon get back to shooting threes and hitting threes. That's the only way I see them working together because Isaac, I don't, pro I don't project him as a a lethal knockdown three-point shooter i project him to being a above average three-point shooter if aaron gordon can't shoot above average from three-point land i think um i think the the move would be to trade aaron gordon aaron gordon's a player who's been on the trade block for this orlando magic team for the past two years it's finally coming to fruition the time to trade this man from orlando i don't know what exactly for but you can walk that bridge when you get to it and then once you trade Aaron Gordon, you can commit to Jonathan Isaac and Mo Bamba as your power forward and center duo. And oh my god, the defense between those two is incredible. You have two seven footers, both can protect the rim like two of the best players in the league basically. Um, Isaac is a player that can guard, hopefully eventually he'll be able to guard all five positions because he's an athletic forward, a lengthy forward. And Mo Bamba has been a rim protecting extraordinaire and he's only going to get better with more experience against NBA offenses and learning how to defend the pick and roll. And then you have Marco Fultz on the perimeter who should be a solid, um, who sh in my opinion he should be solid on the defensive end because I'm really high on his defensive potential. So you have a 1-4-5 set of Fultz, Isaac, and Bamba. The obvious path or the obvious plan of action for going forward is to add offense at the wing positions. Mo Bamba is not going to provide much shot creation. Jonathan Isaac may improve, but he's still going to have limited shot creation. You're banking on Fultz to be your main shot creator right now. I think I don't think he will project to be that. I think he can project to be a good second or third option in terms of scoring the ball. You really need to add offense at the wing positions, shooting guard and small forward. How do they do that? Possibly trading up in the draft adding a disgruntled scoring star wing um, either at the trade deadline or in the offseason using your contracts at Fournier when you resign him Aaron Gordon if he's still on the team at the time of uh, when that scoring star wing is available and maybe an upcoming mid-tier pick that would be my plan of action but that is probably the plan of action that Orlando will not employ most likely they'll be content at remaining at their current standing because if we can base it off their prior history of being a franchise of the players and talent that they've had in the runtime of their franchise they had a generational talent in Shaquille O'Neal a young they drafted Shaquille O'Neal a generational talent took them to the NBA finals against Hakeem Elijah Wan on the and the Rockets in 1994 while he was still a baby and they developed a dynamic duo between him and Penny Hardaway, a young dynamic duo. They were Shaq and Kobe before Shaq and Kobe was Shaq and Kobe, but they let that fizzle out. They, not even an entire decade later, oh wait, no. Oh yeah, literally a decade later, they get a prime or they draft Dwight Howard 
And we know who prime Dwight Howard was. He was a perennial defensive player of the year. Not perennial defensive player of the year candidate. He was a perennial defensive player of the year winner. Um, and that led him to being a fringe MVP candidate. They got to the finals one time against Kobe and the Lakers where they lost. And besides that, they did very little to add talent around him. They got, I don't even remember how they got Jameer Nelson. I don't know if that was with the draft, but that was the best teammate that Dwight Howard played with in Orlando. That goes to show you that Orlando is really hesitant to do anything to increase their standing in terms of talent, in terms of going after a championship. The most talent that they're going to get is lucking into the number one pick. And we've seen that with Shaquille O'Neal. They were reluctant to add talent around him and keep him. And the same applied to Dwight Howard. So to summarize, the Magic are a very interesting team in my opinion. They have intriguing young stars in Markel Fultz, Jonathan Isaac, and Mo Bamba. And we nobody knows exactly what their ceiling is. We don't know if Mo Bamba will ever develop a consistent three-point shot. If he does, he is literally the center that everyone would want, a two-way stretch center in today's league. Markel Fultz, a lot of people are high on, but he has to show what that potential he has to show what that potential is. We see a lot of signs that point to what he could be, but he hasn't shown it yet. I'm still holding on hope for Markel Fultz. And John Isaac, the question marks are around his durability and his health. Um, will he ever really be able to sustain his talent level due to health? Or will he ever really be able to show it over the course of an 82 game season? That's going to do it for today's video. If you did enjoy, leave a like. And if you're new here, subscribe. I do more NBA talk videos like this, including NBA team breakdowns like this and NBA rankings. I recently dropped the NBA ranking at top 10 point guards of this NBA season. I also do NBA 2K20 rebuilds, so if you're interested in that, subscribe so you can see them whenever I upload them. Anyways, hope you enjoyed. Um, until next time, it's been your boy IV. I'll catch y'all later.